occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On The Move with Max Worley III. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, patriots and preppers. I'm Mac Willie III, and this is On The Move, the show that attempts to inspire you to stand up for your rights. As I've said before, this is not my show. This is your show. This is your grassroots activism movement. It's the On The Move movement, and it cannot function without you. So I'd like to take this moment to thank each and every one of you for your patriotism and for taking the time to get involved. The date is May 11th, 2014, and we have a really good show in store for you. Today, uh, we have the pleasure of being joined by special guest and uh, Clark County Sheriff candidate Ed Owens. He's, uh, he's running as an independent for the, uh, the Clark County Sheriff uh, race, and he'll be joining us today around 5.20 p.m., uh, and we're also going to be talking about whatever else comes up with you guys. Anything that you would like to, to bring to the table, feel free to call in with your own topics. So anything you'd like to discuss, we'll be taking your calls and reading your emails. So if you'd like to join the conversation today, just uh, give us a call. The number of the show is 619-924-0986. Again, that's 619-924-0986. Or again, you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. Uh, don't forget to check us out. We got a website on the dot com. You can check us out here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash on the move show. Our Facebook page is Facebook page or <laughs> Facebook dot com uh, forward slash on the move show. YouTube dot com forward slash on the move show. We got a bunch of original videos, lots of uh, content on our YouTube page. Feel free to subscribe and uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, Twitter dot com forward slash on the move show. So. Uh, you can also check out our stores. We've got a bunch of gear on our stores, a whole bunch of different merchandise, you know, T-shirts, freeze-dried foods, books I recommend reading, bumper stickers, and a whole bunch of other content is on our website, uh, the onthemoveshow.com, uh, onthemoveshow.com, and you click on the shop link there on our homepage, and it'll take you into several of our different stores. We've got a bunch of different stuff on there. All that gear is originally designed, uh, especially in the, like our Cafe Press store, um, the the original designs that we have on there are made by us for you guys so you know by patriots for patriots and your purchases will help make our our program our podcast here you know bigger and better so we really do appreciate your support that money will will go towards the program so anyway uh we're moving on here so uh i just want to give you guys a heads up we're still in the works with the patriotfb.com thing uh we're joining their network and that will be happening soon so just be prepared. There will be some changes that are coming up, uh, but we're still learning how to how to work everything in that system. So it's just a little technical. So it's going to take some time. So, uh, but we are in the process. Everything is uh, is moving towards that. So uh, be prepared. Uh, we will be making some changes with this, and I'm I'm real excited to join the Patriot FB uh, PatriotFB.com network. And if you guys haven't checked it out, go over to PatriotFB.com. It's it's Facebook for Patriots. So, you know, it's a place that we can go. We don't have to worry about being censored. You know, I hear all the time where people are, are being put in Facebook jail. You know, I, I actually had a moment uh, just a little bit ago. For some reason, Facebook uh, decided to tell me that my name is not my name. So they, you know, I log in and they they apparently suspended my account. And Facebook tells me that I'm using a false name. And my name on there was Mac Worley the third. That's my name, everybody. I'm the third Mac Worley, but they, they apparently did not like the fact that I had the Roman numeral number three in my name on Facebook. So anyway, they suspended my account. I had to log in and verify my, my name and everything. And now, for some reason, my name is only Mac Worley. You know, it's, I, I can't specify that I'm you know one of three. So uh, anyway, it, you know, it's, it, it's kind of annoying. Uh, but you know, this is the stuff that you have to deal with when you're on Facebook. Facebook is a big conglomerate company and they, you know, it, it's really difficult to get, it's, it's really difficult to get any, anything to, to happen when you're working with their customer service people. I, I actually did the, um, uh, the report a problem, all this stuff and n- nobody messaged me, nobody emailed me, nothing's happening. So uh, I, I would imagine that I'm never going to get <laughs> that number, Roman numeral number three back in my name on Facebook. Anyway, long, boring story, but hey, you know, I, I just want to give you guys some examples of some of the stuff that you got to deal with when you're on Facebook. 
and and also on Facebook, uh, you know, another kind of thing. I hear people getting uh, banned or, or or put in Facebook jail for like sending out invites to podcast events, like this kind of thing. I know several people that had that happen to them. So just give me a heads up. You know, Facebook is kind of it's it's annoying. So you know, this pa- PatriotFB.com. It, this could be a good alternative. I'm really excited to to try to learn how to use this and and get a new form of social media, a place where I can go and you know uh, collaborate with like-minded patriots. So anyway, uh, so what's been going on this week here? Uh, you know, first of all, I just want to give everybody a heads up. I've been sick all week, and uh, I don't know if you can tell it in my voice, but I still am am not better. I'm trying to recover, uh, but you know the show must go on. We're gonna con- continue pressing on and. Uh, you know, if I cough in the microphone a bunch of times, I apologize. You know, I I just can't seem to shake this cold. So, you know, last week I've been, you know, I was so busy. I think I maybe worked myself into uh, uh, getting sick, but uh, I don't know. Um, but you know, we we did uh, on Friday we did the segment on sounding off with Tank and Tony. Uh, this segment we were talking about, uh, you know, a lot of people who are real eager to to jump into uh, civil war kind of secession movements. Things like that, and they don't really have like a how or a why or, or really a plan. They just they just know that they're they're upset. But anyway, I give you guys my take on that. So feel free to check out the the segment on uh, sounding off with Tank and Tony, uh, and we do uh, I do a segment on their show at about 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time every Friday. Uh, their show starts at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time every Friday, and you can listen to them at BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash Sounding Off with Tank and Tony. So anyway, uh, now is it's time for the first segment of the show, and we like to call this This Day in History. This Day in History. Because people have got to so know my whether or not the president is a crook. Well, I'm not a Yes, today, the country can do for you. Mr. Gorbachev, you can do for you. In the people who are not deserving them. A date which will live in infamy. We shall fight in the field and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. All right. So on this day in history, according to Wikipedia, on May 11th, 1935, this is 79 years ago today, the Rural Electrification Administration was created as one of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal programs. At the time, the Rural Electrification Act was passed the electricity was uh, electricity was commonplace in cities, but largely unavailable in farms, ranches, and other rural places. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued Executive Order 7037 on May 11, 1935, establishing the Rural Electrification Administration. It was proposed by Representative John E. Rankin and Senator George William Norris. The act was signed into law by Roosevelt. Uh, the Rural Electrification Act of 1935 provided federal loans for the installation of electrical distribution systems to serve rural areas of the United States. The funding was channeled through cooperative electrical companies, uh, most of which still exist today. These member-owned cooperatives uh, purchased power on a wholesale basis and distributed it using their network of transmission and distribution lines. The Rural, Electri- <laughs> the Rural Electrification Act was also an attempt made by FDR's New Deal to deal with crippling amounts of unemployment. Uh, so I have here a you know some thoughts on the New Deal. You know I, I typically I actually think that the New Deal was a bad deal, and you know that's just my personal opinion. But uh, anyway, I, I'm uh, I'm supported with uh, with other people who who say it too. So. Uh, Let's look at, for example, you know the, the the similarities between how Obama has tried to basically, you know, stimulate the economy, get in the way of the free market, things like that. Uh, I have here a clip from Reason TV. They they discuss basically how government intervention into the free market actually hurts uh, hurts the the recovery in recessions and in depressions, things like that. FDR tried to stimulate the the economy out of the depression, but uh, and a, a lot of people think that he actually helped, but it's actually it been proven that he really did more damage, and he may have actually uh, caused us to prolong our depression. So, and as we can see now, you know, relating things today, Obama has done the same kind of thing. You know, he's prolonged our recession, 
we, we we could have already we would have been in a much better place had we not intervened in our economy during the you know the economic crises and all the bailouts and all that stuff that we you know we've already talked about on previous uh, podcasts. But here here I got a clip from uh, Reason TV. I'll go ahead and play it, and you guys uh, you guys can hear it for yourself. Just give me one second to get it loaded here because uh, it's uh, it's not in uh, Blog Talk, so we got to do it. Through my computer, and again, I'm still trying to learn how to use this mixer, so it's it's pretty funny how uh, how this works. So let me see if I can get this thing working. Have you been reading anything about the depression, anything about FDR? You know, I have uh, actually. I, I was uh, there is a uh, there's a new book out about uh, FDR's first hundred days. <laughs> Okay. okay, I just realized I messed this thing up here, so <laughs> I'm going to try this one more time here. We're going to go back a little bit here, and uh, let me see if I can work this thing out. Have you been reading anything about the Depression, anything about FDR? You know, I have, uh, actually. I, I was, uh, there is a, uh, there's a new book out about uh, FDR's first 100 days. Hi, I'm Michael Moynihan for Reason TV. The American economy is in crisis, and Barack Obama has promised to change Washington. But some of those closest to Obama and some of his loudest media cheerleaders are advising him to look backwards towards FDR's New Deal for inspiration. The idea of a new New Deal has crossed the lips of countless Democrats in the past six months. As Massachusetts Congressman Jim McGovern recently said, I think we could be on the edge of an era in this country of bold, dramatic change equal to the great society and the New Deal. An aide close to Obama told New York Magazine that a lot of people around Barack are reading books about FDR's first hundred days. A kind of New Deal mania has gripped the pundit class. Your book is The Defining Moment, FDR's Hundred Days and the Triumph of Hope. It's the new New Deal, and it's uh, Barack Obama and what? FDR. No, I want him to call for something like a new New Deal. But what if everything we think we know about the New Deal is wrong? What if FDR's massive intervention into the American economy actually prolonged the Great Depression? For something to restore our confidence, our hope, our courage. Without jobs, we had no money. As popular myth has it, it was Keynesian economics that saved America from the Depression, delivering a wounded country from total disaster. People to the bread lines. Anxiously, we waited, waited for some sign of better days. Then came the federal government's work program. One by one, it took us out of the... Without the New Deal, say its defenders, America would have spiraled even deeper into economic crisis. Into faces filled with hope and happiness. For now, we work again. The people who lived through the Depression said, Roosevelt saved us. Um, and it's just a very closely held to the hard view. That's UCLA economics professor Leo Hanyan, author, along with his colleague Harold Cole, of a study demonstrating that FDR's New Deal policies actually prolonged the Depression by seven years. The National Industrial Recovery Act, which was passed in 1933, allowed firms to collude. So, for example, if you and I were in the auto industry, you know, General Motors and Ford, the government allows us to say, okay, we'll have a minimum price. You, know, you don't undercut me. I won't undercut you. That leads to higher profits. And we could do that provided that we raised wages for our workers substantially. And that's exactly what happened. When you increase monopoly, and you increase the wage above the normal wage, you're going to have less output and less employment. We didn't really have any recovery. I mean, unemployment remained 15, 18 percent throughout the 1930s. Um, so there is this flawed view. I think people are beginning to pick up on that. So if the bold, persistent experimentation of the New Deal wasn't the economic panacea of popular myth, just what should FDR have done in 1933? According to O'Hanion and Cole, if FDR had loosened the money supply, avoided the rigid fixing of wages and prices, and instead let market forces work, the economy would have restarted itself much sooner. In other words, had the government not intervened in such a massive way, say O'Hanion and Cole, the recovery would have been very rapid, and the economic slump would have ended as early as 1936. Instead, the Depression, by most estimates, lasted until 1943. The economy is officially in recession, and it looks like we're in for a long, slow road to recovery. But our situation is hardly analogous to the Great Depression. So is a new New Deal really what we need right now? Especially if it works like the old New Deal did? For Reason TV, I'm Michael Moynihan. All right. 
So that is uh, that's what Reason TV says about the the New Deal and uh, basically how that affected the economy and how it actually didn't bring us out of uh, of the depression. So, you know, it, it my my whole point on this is, you know, and I kind of want to talk about the free market a little bit here. Yeah, I know you guys hear me beat that drum a lot, but uh, I'd like to explain something. The the free market it is a self correcting system. And what I mean by a self-correcting system is that it, it does actually take care of itself. So you don't need to get involved. You don't need to intervene. You know, the, these programs that will actually uh, – they're supposed to stimulate the economy. They do more to hurt the economy than they do to help. And it's, you know, it's just like all the programs from the left. You know, it's, it's – the, the programs that are specifically designed to help something usually are the ones that actually – damage what they're trying to help so for example minimum wage uh, i mean the, those kind of things you know the, the people that are hurt the most by minimum wage are the people that can least afford to to be hurt by it and it's the poor you know it, and and this is this holds true for it for you know the when you're trying to stimulate the economy you you devalue the money uh, the, especially what they what they did with the bailouts and all that you know Who's to really say that our economy wouldn't have been better off had we not bailed out, you know, uh, General Motors and and Chrysler? You know, we could have actually been doing way, way better. You know, we could have not deflated the economy. We could have, you know, ha- had those companies turn over uh, ownership to somebody who would manage them better. Maybe we'd been better off. Who knows? But unfortunately, we will never know because the government has gotten involved. And you know, just like they did with the New Deal, and it's really unfortunate that that we have the government interfering with the free market because you know there's no need, there's no need. And for me, it's I honestly believe that it's about power and it's about them trying to to get control of things. And you know, I I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of the, of, of bailing out companies. I think that it it eliminates people's risk. You know, it, you incentivize risk when when people are are seeing that they'll just get built, bailed out. The the phrase "too big to fail," you know that those kind of things. People should be held responsible for their actions or inactions, their bad decisions. You know, everybody, and and I'm not saying that that you know people should be punished, but you know if you if you make a risky decision, you you make a bad move, then you should have to you know pay the consequences. Somebody else shouldn't have to pay the consequences because you made a big mistake. You know, and and you know, I, I understand a recession is not good. It's it, it's a horrible thing to have to go through. But sometimes you have to go through rough times in order to get to a better situation. Otherwise, I mean, we could just sit here and drag out a recession, you know, a, a depression, which it seems like what we're doing, and it seems like that's what the the New Deal did. You know, it extended the uh, the depression seven additional years. The free market would have pulled it, it pulled our country out of the depression seven years before. It did, without the government interfering. So anyway, at this point, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we get back, we're going to have uh, Sheriff Candidate Ed Owens on the line, and uh, we're going to be taking your uh, your your questions. And uh, uh, I got a bunch of questions for him myself, so uh, I'm looking forward to this interview. If you guys would like to join the conversation, the number to the show is six one nine nine two four zero nine eight six. Again, that's six one nine nine two four zero nine eight six, or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow dot com. All right, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. And we're back. 
All right. So at this point, we have Ed Owens on the line. He is uh, running for the sheriff's office here in uh, Clark County. Uh, that's uh, in, I live in uh, Vancouver, Washington, so he's, he's in uh, my county that he's running for. So I'm very interested, and I've been following this race very closely. Uh, Ed, are you there? I am, Mac. I am. All right. Well, how are you doing, first of all? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. And I would like to say to all the moms out there, happy Mother's Day today. <laughs> that was you just you just got some extra votes right there. I'm sure a lot of moms out there are are, uh, are very touched by that. So, uh by the way, and and I appreciate I know um you have children and uh your wife is uh giving you up uh for uh, for us to do this interview today. I really appreciate that, uh, you know, especially it's her day. So tell her again. I know I said it before, but I just want to publicly thank her for for, for letting us uh, borrow you today. I will. I will let Christy know. All right. Uh, okay, so I, I have uh, I have some questions for you, and some of these I don't know if you heard the interview from last week. We had uh, your opponent uh, John Grazer on uh, on last on the last show. Some of these are going to be some yeah. of the similar questions. I, I don't know if you heard the interview, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, some of them have been kind of changed to to work for you. Uh, give me one okay. second here. Something's uh, something's popping up on my <laughs> on my screen here. Okay, there we go. All right. Anyway, so so these questions. Um, let me let me cut right to the chase here. First things first. I want to know uh, why do you want the job, Mr. Owens? Well, I have a culmination of experience. My whole career has prepared me for this job. Uh, 23 years in law enforcement, uh, retired from the military reserves uh, as a first sergeant. So I'm familiar with leading large groups of people um, in order to accomplish the mission. But at the same time, I take care of my people. Uh, here in Clark County, um, I served on the law enforcement council for almost six years uh, as one of the agency heads when I was with WSU Vancouver. So I'm familiar with what it takes at an executive level to run an agency, to um to lead a large group of people and to do it in an effective way. Uh, you know, I have the background and I've worked specialties and, you know, I have my degree and all in the pedigree that goes with a long service career of being in service to my community. Yes, sir. So, you know, for me, I've, I'm always um, really distrusting of people who, who actually want to be politicians or want some kind of uh, power, you know, it, I think those are the kind of people that probably you shouldn't give power to. But, uh, you know, I, I find it interesting that, that you're running as an independent. And uh, one question I had is actually, what, why did you decide to run as an independent? The position of the sheriff, I don't personally believe, uh, should be partisan politics. Um, you know, if you need assistance or your neighbor needs assistance, uh, the sheriff's office responsibility is to serve your needs, respond, and we're not going to ask what your political ideology is. We're there to serve whatever that need is. Um, so I don't believe it's a partisan position. And you made the comment about somebody who wants to be a politician. Um, this is not something I ever thought about, uh, mm -hmm. running for office. Uh, it's a decision that I made um, late last year. Um, you know, I actually resisted it quite a bit concept of it, um, but I made that decision that it's important if somebody wants to be that change in their community, um, we can sit and we can talk about it. We can, you know, be upset or angry at what we see happening in our community, or I'm the type of person that's going to step forward and say, well, I'm willing to step forward and make that change. I'm willing to be that agent of change instead of just staying on the side and talking about it. And I, I, okay, so that, that actually leads me to a question here, and I, I want to actually find out because if if you know you were compelled to do it, you didn't think that there were any other candidates out there that uh, that really fit the bill, you know, were acceptable candidates for sheriff, um, you know, that's why you decided to step up and run. What are some of the main differences between you and your your opponents out there? You, I, mean, I don't want you to sit here and trash them or anything. I just want to know, you know, where do you guys stand differently? No, no, I'm not going to do that with my opponents. You know, I, I've said this several times, and I'll say it again now for all your listeners. For the first time in almost three decades, the citizens in this county have an opportunity to pick a new type of sheriff or a what they want their sheriff's office to be like. We've had the same leadership um, within this county for so long. Most people grew up underneath that leadership. 
Um, so I'll, there's there's a wide range of choice for the first time in a long time. Now, differences. Um, we're all capable. Um, like I said, there are some differences in you know, some of my background from the, in this military and the, some of the executive work I did there. That's a difference, um, especially being that first sergeant. And that's a very specialized position within the military. Another difference, I served on the law enforcement council, like I mentioned. Um, of the four candidates, I'm the only one that has done that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, those are two very important differences. We all have distinguished careers. We all have worked a wide range of issues. Um, but one thing that really, I think, separates me besides what I've mentioned is my experiences are culminated from multiple agencies, multiple different types of settings and environment. And I'm not, I'm not tied to the uh, existing structure here in Clark County. Um, I guess I worked for the sheriff's office for seven years, but um, I bring experiences from other places, other ways of doing things, um, instead of just within this one agency. Yes, sir. And first of all, I just want to say thank you for your service. Uh, I, I understand you were in the Air Force and your first shirt, and I think that's uh, that's really awesome that you uh, you did that. Uh, I was uh, actually Air Force as well, so uh, again, <laughs> I, I really appreciate what you guys did. Uh, you know, I, I had a, a lot of encounters with my first shirts, and they uh, they do a lot of good in the in the unit. So, you know, I, I really appreciate what you did. And uh, as far as uh, your your time as a first sergeant, uh, can you just to, just to give an idea of some of the things you went through? Can you uh, you know give our audience uh, just uh, maybe some some uh, obstacles that you had to overcome while you were a first sergeant? Well, you know, a first sergeant is uh, a very busy position within a unit. Um, you know, you have two sides. I always tell folks that aren't familiar with a first sergeant, it's kind of like the mother and the father of a unit. You know, you're responsible for the discipline and the, um, on that side of the house, but as more of a nurturing um, mother, you are responsible for taking care of your people, making sure that they're well-trained making sure that they're very competent to do their job, um, making sure that not just the, the employee, but their entire family is taken care of and the relationships within the unit are taken care of with other units, with the community. Um, so challenges with that, they don't have a lot of personnel issues. And it can be very, very challenging. Um, you know, you have 100, 200, 400 people, and they all have their lives. And so balancing you know, helping each of those people while still getting the mission done, it can be quite challenging. Um, you know, I've I've had members in my unit, um, you know, killed in action um, or die in accidents, and then dealing with those and interacting with uh, the families and, of course, the people in the unit um, and helping them through that moment. Um, those have been some very challenging moments in my career. Mm hmm I, I can imagine. And, and, you know, the first sergeant, I've had firsthand experience with uh, my first sergeant. You know, they helped me uh, when uh, I had a death in the family and all that. And uh, I, I had I had people uh, help me uh, get a, a plane ticket home. Uh, it was – the first sergeant did a lot for me, and, you know, I, I really value uh, that position especially. So, so again, thank you for, for doing that. Uh, moving forward here, yeah. I got some questions from uh, from listeners. Sure. Uh one listener would like to know if uh, if you're uh, affiliated at all with the Oath Keeper movement, uh, the the group, the Oath Keepers. Do you know anything about them, first of all? Yes, I am familiar with um, the Oath Keepers and, um, you know, their commitment uh, to the oath they've taken, whether it be law enforcement or military, uh, to the Constitution. Okay, so so are you a, a member, or uh, do you uh, support those uh, the, the ten tenets that they have? Uh, there's a uh, ten orders that they won't follow. Have have you uh, looked at at that at all? Um, I have looked at it in the past. Um, I'm not a member of the Oath Keepers. Um, I could not recite to you all ten of those tenets. Um, mm -hmm. I believe and support the concept of what the Oath Keepers stand for. Um, that they're you know we have a great constitution and a bunch of great constitutional rights, making sure that those rights are honored and respected and protected. Uh, I definitely agree with the concept of the organization. Okay. So 
this leads me to my next question here, and uh, I'm I'm really interested because I, I haven't actually uh, seen any of uh, the information on your website about this topic. Um, okay. But uh, as far as far as the the Second Amendment, you know, uh, it, one question that I would like to ask you, and I I, I want to get a very clear answer here. Okay, so uh, I just I would I'd like to know if you would ever under any circumstance participate in the confiscation of firearms from American citizens. Uh, whether or not it's it's somebody ordering you to do it or you ordering someone else to do it. All right, that's a that sure answer that I want. For you? Yeah, yeah. I like I like the clarity there because if it, you know if if you're not clear on this, you know, and one thing you know, I, I got a problem with uh, with Adkins, his uh, his social media, his website thing that he he kind of does a, a a dodge on it where he's like, I can't imagine a scenario where I would participate in this kind of a situation. That that to me is a really evasive way to answer the question. I like yes or no que- yes or no answers to those kind of things. So I want to move on uh, as far as open carry, concealed carry, constitutional carry. Where where do you stand? What are your thoughts? Okay, well this is an open carry state, so citizens have the right. As long as you know they can own a gun, they have the right to carry it open carry. Um, you know, there obviously are some restrictions. You can't carry open carry on someone else's property without their consent. But in the public, you have the right to carry a weapon. Um, that's the law. And as sheriff, uh, I'm going to defend that and protect your right to carry open carry. Concealed carry, um, you know, we have laws in the state of Washington. Of a, you know, there are some people that are excluded uh, from being able to get a concealed weapons permit. Um, or concealed license, um, convicted felons, people involved in domestic violences, those types of things. Uh, you know, I support those exclusions, but this is a you know shall issue state, and so if a citizen comes to me as the sheriff at the sheriff's office and wants a concealed permit, they go through the process. You know, I'll issue a concealed license. Okay, so so you're not. Uh, it, I, you know, I've heard I've heard a lot of uh, different sheriffs out there that said, you know, you have to have like specific reasons uh, why they'll issue you a permit. Like especially in like California or more left leaning uh, places. Uh, I know we we are pretty left leaning here as well, I guess. But uh, you know, it, it, I just want to make sure and be clear: you won't uh, reject concealed carry permits. Uh, it, you know, as, as long as somebody is, it doesn't have some kind of domestic uh, domestic thing on their record or they're they're <clears throat> part of the the list of people that can't have them. Yeah, if if they if they're on that exclusion, you know, the, the, the citizens of this state have said the following categories are excluded. If they're excluded, then I'm, I cannot issue a permit to them. Okay. But if they're not, if they're not on an excluded list, such as say a convicted felon or somebody who's been convicted of a domestic violence crime, those are just two examples I can think of off the top of my head. Um, you know, why you choose to carry concealed is because that's your right. Uh, you mentioned California. We're not in California. We're in Washington. Exactly. You know, this is a shall issue state. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so as okay. A citizen, you're entitled to it. As far as the whole process, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this. Uh, do you think that the fact that we have to ask for permission to exercise a right, such as concealed carrying, uh, do you think that that's a, a constitutional process? Uh, do you think that it's it, that uh, well, actually, I guess the question I'm asking is, do you support constitutional carry that, where you don't require a permit to carry a firearm? I do not support the constitutional carry concept because how are you going to know if that individual is a convicted felon or one of those groups that shouldn't have a firearm um, if there's not a checks and balance to make sure that, um, that that's out there? See, I mean, how would my you make opinion. Sure that is? Oh well, I, I can. I mean, I can tell you how it's. It's not. It's not your responsibility to find out if that person carrying is is a felon unless they've committed a crime or, or they do something, you know. And, and the fact is, there's already things out there. I mean, we uh, we could get into this debate, but I I don't want <laughs> I don't want to move it towards that. I you know I don't want to try to to debate you. I just want to ask a question. But yeah, it, it's, as far as that, you know, I think we differ on that a little bit uh, significantly, but. <laughs> Anyway, so, so my next That's question okay. here, yeah, it's it's all right to disagree. Uh, I'm again, I I just I want to kind of be as impartial here as possible, uh, just so the the listeners out there can get as much uh, information from you as, as they can. So, um, 
All right, I got another question from a listener here. Uh, as far as gun-free zones, what are your thoughts on these? Do you think that they they help deter crime, or are they uh, you know a, a negative thing? I believe that the presence of there's a lot of literature out there and a lot of research. Um, you know, gun-free zones don't necessarily stop a criminal. They don't stop a crime. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion, and I don't know if you're alluding to schools or if you're alluding to other locations. Um, but, you know, the presence of an armed individual can deter and often will stop if something starts a crime from continuing. And there's a lot of really good examples out there you could cite on it. Um, you know, there's one of the things that I'm very in favor of is expanding out our school resource program to our middle schools for a lot of different reasons. But one of that, you know, is the presence of an armed individual within our schools. Um, there's been discussion about, you know, would you be willing to or would you support um, arming qualified teachers that are trained? Um, you know, to go through the background and everything else. And I very much would entertain that discussion. I do agree that the presence of um, those types of things can prevent incidents like we've seen in this country or we've seen elsewhere around the world. What are your thoughts on uh, the the teachers arming? Uh, it, there's there's a lot of places, especially I think in Oregon, there's a place uh, that that is allowing uh, teachers to to arm themselves if they choose to conceal carry uh, permit holders to conceal in the classroom. Uh, do you support that? I do, as long as that program we sit down and and law enforcement's aware of it, and we're at the table, we discuss it, we make sure that those who are carrying inside the school understand. Um, they're trained. Um, we're aware of it just for if nothing else from an officer safety standpoint, a safety for the, the students in the school. I know there's teachers that have concerns, so these are all going to have to be discussed, but I definitely would support having that discussion, and I would support that type of a model, but we, we all need to sit down together and agree what it's going to look like. Okay. So I got another listener question here. Uh, they want to know uh, – you know, and we've kind of touched on this before. Uh, obviously, you'd be swearing an oath to the Constitution uh, and the Bill of Rights, which you've already done before. But they want to know if you actually support it, and they also want to know if you're willing to sign the Constitutional Sheriff and Peace Officers Association resolution, uh, where it it basically you know is is another uh, another oath to uh, to support the Constitution. Well, that's a two part question. We'll answer the first one. Um, do I believe, fully believe in the Constitution? Absolutely. Uh, and my oath is to the federal and state constitutions, uh, both of them. Uh, in Washington, we have the, you know, we're lucky to live in a state that actually grants, in a lot of ways, more protections for the citizen than under the federal Constitution. Uh, so we're very fortunate in this state. In regards to the resolution, um, after I listened to your show with uh, Grazier, I was trying to actually find a good copy of that. Um, so I don't know. I'd have to read that and actually make a decision. I don't know if I would or wouldn't sign it, and just being honest with you. But I do support my oath to both constitutions, and I will protect citizens' rights regarding that in this county. Yes, sir. Well, as far as uh, where to find the uh, the the association resolution, it's uh, cspoa.org for my listeners. Anybody out there that would like to check that out, uh, and it's it basically have drafted this uh, with a different constitutional sheriffs, uh, and I think it was drafted in Las Vegas uh, and approved by the members present. So uh, they they encourage all sheriffs, peace officers, and those in public office to sign it. Uh, and they welcome all signatures from other U.S. citizens. So feel free, anybody, if you are interested, check it out. It's uh, cspoa.org, and uh, and they have a lot of good information on there about it. So uh, that was just provided from one of my listeners. So <laughs> I've, uh, I've, okay. I've looked at that briefly. So, all right, I, I got another question for you, sir. Um, as far as uh, the Clive and Bundy Ranch situation, I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard about it in the news. Hey, were, you, were you following that situation at all? Yes, of course. Okay, so if anything, uh, what would you have done differently if you were the sheriff in Clark County, Nevada? Uh, there's, a, there's a few things that I would have done differently. Um, first, I would have been there from day one if it had gotten to that point. Um, I don't believe it should have ever got as far as it did. Uh, from what I've been able to gather by reading as much as I possibly can, I'm not there and I don't have access to a lot of the information and 
you know, true solids in between the two versions that you see. Mm-hmm. But from what I can gather, you know, a decision was reached, uh, and they waived, or I should say, they suspended the 30-day uh, public comment on this decision to round up these cattle uh, in the interest of law enforcement, you know, pending law enforcement operations or however they phrased it. Uh, so there's a couple of questions with that. One, uh, why did they suspend the comment period? If it truly was for something law enforcement related, then why wasn't the sheriff involved in that discussion? Absolutely. So why yeah. wasn't the sheriff brought in during that period of time to discuss this is what's going on and this is what we are proposing or we want to do or whatever? But that discussion, I can't find where that happened. Well, it seems like um, Sheriff I, Gillespie, he, he had a hands-off approach on this. He basically just let the BLM do whatever they wanted, from what I understand. I And that's kind of what I'm reading as well. And it wasn't until after the demonstration outside um, his headquarters that he actually went out. Um, and I may be wrong in what I, my understanding of that is, but that's what I read. Um, he should have been involved in the planning phase. If there was going to be something going on, uh, he should have been at the table having that discussion um, and either to prevent whatever was going to happen from happening, to be involved in it, to make sure that it didn't get to the situation we had. We should have never had that type of confrontation, uh, particularly if everybody is involved in the discussion and everybody is involved in resolving something before it gets to that point. So if you were in that situation and things are escalating, you know, it's looking like it's going to be, a, you know, an armed conflict, what would you do? Well, the sheriff needs to be there. And if I can't, if you're involved, I can't see that if the sheriff would have been involved, if I was involved in this as the sheriff down there, I can't see that it would have gotten to that point because I would have been involved on the ground from the beginning. Now, worst case scenario, you have a situation that takes place like we what we saw. The sheriff was not consulted. The sheriff was not involved. Um, then the sheriff needs to be there immediately and do like what was done by that metro chief out of Vegas. Um, you know, negotiate that both sides are going to pull back on this. Nobody wins in an armed conflict between citizens um, okay. and you know law enforcement, and you know. Diffuse the situation, resolve it, get it calmed down, and then, you know, I saw just this week that uh, he's opened an investigation into the events leading up to uh, what happened during and subsequent to it. And I'm looking forward to reading, you know, the results of his investigation. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be following that, that's for sure. So. Okay, I got a, another question here from a listener. Um, they want to know what your plans are in Clark County here at home, uh, not the one in Nevada, uh, to fight crime. So, so what what is your actual plan to actually, you know, uh, help us, you know, uh, fight crime here at home? You know, being not even just the big ones, but also like uh, you know, uh, small little burglaries and things like that. That uh, like. Uh, uh, vandalism, things like that. It, what, what do you have on the table? Uh, what are some of your ideas? Well, we have a lot of great programs in the sheriff's office that are effective. Um, some of them can be expanded. Some of them I don't think we do enough of. Um, we, it's just a broad question because um, <laughs> there's no one thing that you can sit there and pinpoint and say, well, if we do this, we will have a X percentage reduction in crime. Um, crime is not that simple to describe or any one thing that we can do or two or three things that we do um, to significantly reduce crime. If there's a specific topic you want, want to talk about, we can definitely talk about that. Um, some of my experiences that I know work, um, you know, uh, police work, you know, having good relationships with the citizens, that's critical. You know, if we don't have that positive working relationship, um, we don't, you know, we're not dialed in in which the public feels like they can come to us um, when they don't feel comfortable. Uh, and I'm not saying that's the case right now. I'm just saying but if we don't have that type of a strong relationship, you know, they don't give us the information. There's only so many deputies in this county. 
and we can't be everywhere, and we can't see everything. Well, uh, as so, far as 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 far as particular programs, uh, I I spoke with uh, Mr. Grazer about um, about a knock and talk program. Is that something that you would support, or is that something uh, you're interested in doing? Knock and talks are great. Um, we've been doing it in the law enforcement for a long time. When I was on the narcotics task force, you know, we'd get a tip and you'd go do a knock and talk. Um, it is it is a good tool. Uh, it's not going to solve. Um, all the crime we have in this county. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it, it, it's like any other tool. It has a purpose. Um, deputies on the road can do knock and talks. Detectives can do knock and talks. Um, and it, it, it will affect some things, but it's just a tool. Mm-hmm. It can't be used everywhere to effectively reduce all crime. Absolutely, it's yeah. It's tool. Yeah. As far as any other tools out there, is there any other programs similar to that that you may have an idea about or that you'd like to see implemented in in our county? Well, one area that my last assignment at the sheriff's office is I worked uh, criminal intelligence. Um, I was uh, that was my assignment as a detective, and so I worked with all the law enforcement agencies in Clark County. I also worked with Skamania, Cowlitz, Wakayakum counties, and I supported investigations throughout Southwest Washington. Um, organized crime, gangs, human trafficking, weapons trafficking, you know, all of these types of issues. Um, you know, having a, a, a function within an agency that is sharing information with the other agencies. Because what happens here in Clark County it's not like our criminals live here, commit their crimes here, and they don't ever go anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, we have folks from the surrounding area that come into our county, um, and vice versa, folks from here that go elsewhere. You know, crime doesn't have a boundary. And what I have found in my experience is sharing information and working together with all the agencies around us, um, we actually start to have more of an impact. You, know, you can start to figure out who are those you know, the 10% of the criminals within the community uh, responsible for 90% of your crime. Mm-hmm. So and as far as the kind of programs that, that come together, is that, that like computer networks or some kind of information sharing network? Um, yeah, there are several information networks um, that are available and that are in use, um, you know, which we can share that type of resources. Uh, just recently, um there was an agreement reached between Clark County law enforcement agencies and the Portland area in which, you know, we will work, uh, the commissioners just approved that, I believe it was last month. Um, it's an upgrade so that we can better share information, um, better identify career criminals, um, because they're really the ones that commit most of the criminal behavior in a community. Uh, so that just happened. So expanding those types of systems yeah, I'm very much in favor of it. It's something I did a lot of. Yes, sir. Okay, well, cool. Uh, so as as far as uh, this, uh, I, you know, I've ha- been having a really good time talking with you, Ed. Uh, we got to cut to a quick commercial break. Can you stick around for another segment with us? I can. Okay, great. All right, we'll be right back with more with Ed Owens uh, in about a minute. Don't go anywhere. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. And we're back. I appreciate you all sticking with us. 
We have on the line Mr. Ed Owens, who's running for Clark County Sheriff uh, as a candidate. And uh, we're in the middle of an interview. We're talking about a bunch of different stuff. If you guys have any questions that you'd like to ask him, please give us a call. The number to the show is 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. And uh, I'll ask your your questions on the air. Uh, Are you there, Ed? I am. Okay. All right. So we got another listener question for you. And uh, on your website, it says that, uh, that too many aspects of sheriff's office uh, of the sheriff's office actually lack transparency. So I- I'm curious, uh, what do you mean by that specifically, and uh, what would you do to correct that? <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, there, there are a lot of aspects. You know, one thing that is noticeably absent from the sheriff's office um, is a lot of citizen involvement within the agency. Um, you know, we hire deputies, but there aren't citizens that are involved in that hiring process. You know, There are things and incidents which happen within the sheriff's office, but we don't have any uh, involvement from the community in reviewing those things, reviewing policies, reviewing uh, incidents that take place. Uh, we just don't have that. And to what level we have partnerships with the community and we do work with them in, in those areas, some very good examples, but I want to bring more citizen involvement into the sheriff's office. This is what we do and this is how we do it, but it's based upon your input and the services we provide and how we choose to provide them is based upon input from the citizens. Okay. We rarely have town halls or open forums in which, you know, the sheriff meets with the citizens in a group setting. You know, you see, you see representatives do this, you see other elected officials do it, but we rarely do that. So that's um, something so that you'd like to. The, absolutely. That's something. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, uh, there's a delay on that, Blog Talk Radio. I don't mean to walk uh, over you. Continue. <laughs> uh, you know, we also have. You know, recently I was I was pleased to see that the commissioners authorized uh, two additional positions to help with public records. Uh, we have a lot of public records requests um, as as a county sheriff's office, and. We need to do a much better job in allowing the public access to the records that we have. You know, people have legitimate requests. The information is theirs, and we should be doing a much better job than we have historically regarding these records being released to the public so that you can find out what it is you want to know. So. You know, as far as uh, as far as the license plate tracking uh, program, I was curious. Uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that you support? You would like to implement here in Clark County? The um, license plate tracking the scanners that I'm familiar with that uh, mm-hmm. I have some very limited experience with were used in regards to um, identifying and locating stolen vehicles. And basically, it would be able to collect a large amount of um, data and rapidly identify, hey, there's two stolen vehicles at the mall parking lot, as an example. Um, and then we could recover that stolen property. So that is the application that I've seen used in this county uh, successfully, and then its use is very limited. Uh, it's not, you know, I don't, I'm not aware, I should say, and I don't know of any, uh, other applications that we've been using it here in Clark County. Well, there, there's a lot of people that are concerned uh, with the amount of government surveillance. You know, it, at the cost of uh, privacy, people, you know, people are concerned that uh, even though this may give us some more security as far as uh, being able to catch criminals and things like that, that you know, it's it's one more thing of Big Brother, you know, uh, spying on people and knowing where everybody went. Uh, they can track your license plates and find out where you've been, you know, what your routines are. Things like that. It's very it's the same kind of argument with the drone uh, drone use in the counties as well. So, uh, I just want to be clear: uh, is this a program that you would like to continue, uh, or would this be something that you'd want to keep out of our county? You know, anytime we choose to use a piece of technology to help in law enforcement, you know, you have a responsibility to make sure that that technology is being used and balanced against the rights of the citizen. Um, you know, yeah, there's. A tendency. There's lots of good examples of when technology um, or a new tool comes in, into, you know, the hands of law enforcement where they have the opportunity to use one. Um, it can be abused. You know, the role of a sheriff or a chief or uh, 
anybody who's in a position within law enforcement that supervises is to make sure that if, and I use the word if, it's used, um, that it's used very narrowly um, and it's done in such a way as, you know, it doesn't violate the citizen's rights um, at all. But that's the job of a sheriff and a chief to make sure that's being done correctly. The um, way we've used it in this county, um, just to look for and recover stolen vehicles, and that's what the data is used for, and I know that's what they've used it for. We weren't tracking movements of people. We were looking to recover stolen vehicles. And that type of limited scope use doesn't, in my opinion, violate you know, constitutional rights of privacy. All right, so... Uh Another question here, uh, as far as uh, from your website, uh, on your website you're pictured with uh, an armored military vehicle. Uh, actually, uh, I, I went and checked that out. This is from a listener. Uh, so I, I want to know w- what your thoughts are on these being used in our police departments, and uh, you know, it, what do you think if if you were the pre- or, I'm sorry, if you were the sheriff, I almost said president. If you were the sheriff, <laughs> would you <laughs> would you try to keep these in our our um, our sheriff's office or our, our police departments? Uh, would you do you find a, a, a use for these, uh, or, 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 or I just want to know what you think about them. Okay. The, um, I know which picture you're talking about, and that is an, actually from the Air Force. That's called a peacekeeper. Uh, we use them in security forces. Uh, mm-hmm. And they have a they're, – they're a great tool when they're used correctly. Um, the reason we have them, um, and I would want to continue to have them, is when we, if we need to go into a tactical situation, um, heavily armed subject, or um, some place where we need the armor in order to get close into the situation, then they're used primarily by SWAT or the, some of the tactical units. But they're they're not used for patrol purposes. They're only used in those situations where it's appropriate. Most of the time, when those get taken out, it's for public display or open houses um, or for use by SWAT when they need it because they need that ballistic protection. So, so would you would you be looking to get more or get rid of some of the ones that we have? Uh, from what I understand, we have four of them in the county. Uh, do you think that we need four or we need more or less? Um, four is a good number. I know that they're pre-positioned throughout the county so that if something happens um, down in Vancouver, um, there's one that's housed downtown. Uh, with the Vancouver Police Department. And so if we need one of these, um, you go get it. There's some that are housed out in the county as well so that you don't have to drive 45 minutes one way to go get that vehicle. If there's an active shooter situation, say at a school, um, and you need to get one of these vehicles so that you can respond and get in close to the situation to neutralize it, um, you don't want to have to like I said, drive an hour, hour and a half round trip to get access to one of these. But they're not used for patrol. Uh, I think we have a good number of them. I don't see a reason why we need to buy more. They're pretty expensive. Even when we get them on surplus, you still have to retrofit them. Um, So I can't see buying more of them. But I do agree that we do need them in law enforcement. We pre-position them in the event we have to use it. Okay, so uh, this leads me to uh, the next question here. Uh, as far as your officers uh, wearing video cameras, and, and you know, we've talked about uh, you know transparency in the department and everything. So, uh, in a, a California, uh, in a 12-month period, there's an 88% decrease in complaints filed against officers and a 60% decrease in the use of force by putting cameras on their officers. So. Uh, you know, according uh, to my listener, they say uh, the technology helps with accountability, but also officer safety uh, and evidence. Uh, would you consider implementing something like this in your department? Oh, absolutely, I would consider it. Um, I had this, I've had this discussion with a few people. Um, you know, one of the issues we have right now is it requires a massive amount of storage uh, to store all of those videos, and then under the records retention, store it long enough. Um, so that you know people have access to those records, courts have access to those records, it would be a very large capital outlay to implement that system. I think it's a really good idea to start with um, you know, our tactical units. If we're going to deploy a SWAT team um, or a tactical unit, then those units, I agree, should have a camera on them. That is a very uh, high-profile incident. 
Um, there's a lot of liability potential for the agency, uh, safety issues for the officers and the citizens. Uh, I think that would be a very good place to start with cameras. So then, uh, then I'm guessing that you, you, you back up the statement when you, uh, you said on your website, you know, being open for citizens to be involved and monitor uh, and see what the sheriff's office does is, is critical to the maintenance of trust between sheriff's office and uh, citizens of Clark County. So you wouldn't have a problem with the fact of them having it if you had the logistical capability, them having cameras on their body the whole time they're on shift then? I don't have a problem with that. If you know that's going to require a large capital outlay, um, there are times when I don't think it's appropriate for that camera to be on. I mean, if let's just say that the citizens of this county said we want this, and they overwhelmingly this is something we want, and then we have the ability to fund it and put that type of a system in place. Okay, mm-hmm. um, that doesn't mean that those things, or I would agree that they should always be on. I mean, there are times where I mean, if it's that officer's lunch break, should the camera be on? They're using the restrooms to be on. Oh, okay, and and I get what you're saying with that. It, obviously, there has to be some kind of stipulations to be able to uh, to absolutely you know, not have them being filmed when they're using the restroom or not on uh, you know on duty or something like that. If they're they're on breaks or something, I get that. But uh, but if for the most part though, it, in in acceptable ways of like performing their duties, that's something that you would support though. If we had the logistical ability though, right? We have the logistical ability, and this is what the citizens of this county want to do. Um, then I'm going to support what the citizens of this county would like to see. Okay. Um, I do. I would like to see these cameras on our tactical units. I think that that is something that would be easier to implement um, in the short term. Uh, it's still going to be expensive, but instituting that in the short term. I mean, those are the most critical incidents. Those are the most um, important incidents that law enforcement is involved with, and I think tactical cameras definitely need to be there. Hmm. I, I like the the idea of uh, of having them rolling anytime that they're uh, they're in contact with the public. So if if they're if they're in co- some kind of incident, traffic stop, something like that, I think that they should probably be rolling. I you know, but it does kind of. Uh, touch on the same subject of privacy, uh, not for the officer, but for the citizens as far as, you know, more cameras, more Big Brother, things like that. So there's a lot of stuff on that to, to talk about. But um, anyway, next question here. Um, uh, I would like I to, talk to make to a you. comment about that. Oh, I go ahead. comment about the, the cameras. Um, you know, we have some, a few vehicles that have them for traffic purposes, like our traffic enforcement units. Um, and it's a great tool. And the camera activates when the lights turn on, mm-hmm. and the officer is required to notify the person this is being recorded. And yes, it does have an impact on officers being assaulted, um, a reduction in that, a reduction in complaints. And so we have had that's the only limited use um, that we have had to date, and it's effective. We only have a handful of vehicles with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so. and I, I like I like the fact that uh, we have dash cams and things like that. I I think that's uh, that's that's good for officer safety. I think it's also, you know, the the more that we can record public officials performing their duties, I think the the more accountable they are, and you know, the more protected they are. That's uh, that's officer safety as well because you know now it's not his word versus somebody else's. Now we have a matter of fact, and the camera doesn't lie. So. Anyway, as as far as uh, uh, the next question I have for you, sir, uh, medical marijuana uh, and and recreational marijuana, uh, what's your stance on that? The citizens of the state of Washington, through the referendum initiative process, have made it legal in the state of Washington to possess and consume marijuana. That's the law. So uh, there's a federal standard that's different, but. I'm not going to have. We're not going to enforce somebody because they're, you know, arrest them or write them a citation and, and give them a court date because they're in possession. It's legal. So, so you you would support the the state law over the federal law? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And uh, it's until uh, the recreational marijuana is regulated. Uh, our our uh, this is a listener question, by the way. They want to know if uh, if you can make it the lowest priority of law enforcement in your department. Other departments have implemented this with great success uh, with community relations and fund allocations. Um, well, with it being legal right now, 
I'd have to ask a bunch of my friends on the road, but I don't believe it's a high priority for them. Okay. Um, someone's in possession. Um, I think there's uh, a more important discussion that we should be having, and most we I haven't seen a lot of it yet. Um, you know, whenever these dispensaries or these locations open up, and I know that the state just recently did the lottery uh, mm-hmm. to issue the licenses, and I know they're trying to figure out exactly how they're going to implement this within communities um, to be in compliance with the law. This is legal. Citizens have the right to have it. Um, there's a lot of resistance in communities to having a dispensary for a lot of reasons, and I understand a lot of the arguments on both sides. But the argument that, well, we're not going to have dispensaries here, that way people are going to have to drive say, to the next county, or they're going to have to drive at great distances. Um, I don't think we should be excluding, if it's legal, we should make it accessible, but should we be making people drive an extra half an hour, 45 minutes, um, to obtain something they have a legal right to obtain? You know, are we... See, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I get what you're saying. It, it, does, it does make sense, and I think... Uh, it, it kind of goes back to the, the community itself, though. You know, if the community voted for it, you know, uh, then the community should be uh, should be okay with them them opening these things. Uh, the problem is, is that the you know I think that some of these smaller communities feel like the majority has uh, has outvoted them. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, what do you think as far as that? Do you think a small community should be able to uh, to outvote a the the larger state community? Can you rephrase that? I mean, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Okay, yeah. The, well, as, as far as, the, like, uh, what's going on, some of these smaller cities, municipalities, things like that, they have an issue with the fact that it's been legalized in the state. So, you know, mm-hmm. they are a small community inside the larger community of the state. So I feel like some of these some of these small communities, you know, they are using their veto power, basically, to, to say, hey, well – you know, you guys, you guys in the state voted it legal, but we don't support it here in this community. So we're we're making it inaccessible for these people. As far as that, do you support, you know, the the state uh, saying that as a community that that it, that we should have access to it, or do you think that the small community has a right to keep it out of their their city? It's legal in the state of Washington, and I think if, if I understand what you you're kind of referring to, like the Pierce County ordinance in which Pierce County wanted to basically, until it's deregulated at the federal level, we will not here in our county. Is that what you're getting to, that argument? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, okay. I'm just curious what you, what you think about, you know, city versus state law, county law, stuff like that, as, as far as, you know, if it – because the, the way I look at it, the states are the, – the state is the majority government, basically, it, that's – that's telling the smaller governments, the city and county governments, what to do. And if these city governments don't want it in their city, do you think that they have a right to say no to it in their cities or counties, uh, even if the state says that that they should? You see what I mean? I I, I know yeah, I'm I'm it, I'm having a hard time with this question, but yeah. Yeah, it's and it's a difficult question, and I think it's an important discussion. Uh, because, you know, a city does have its own statutory rights and the community has its own statutory rights, you know, to regulate commerce within its town. And so they can pass ordinances. Um, We need to figure out a way, though, to, you know, work better together in regards to this. I mean, it is the law in Washington that's legal, and I understand some communities don't want it for one reason or another, or... um, and we'll just leave it at that. They don't want it for one reason or another. But we have to figure out a way because it is legal. And how are we going to give the citizens access to something that they have a legal right to have access to? So uh, We have to have that discussion. And if people have concerns, then we need to sit down and figure out what exactly are your concerns um, and where's the common ground that we can all start with on this um, and find something that works for everybody. You know, we can't okay. just push push this over, I mean, to, I'm sorry, you're going to have to drive 100 miles um, to obtain something that you have a legal right to mm-hmm. because we disagree with it here. We need to have that discussion. How are we going to meet the needs of the citizens? That is their right. The citizens of this state said you have the right to smoke marijuana. So well, it, how do we... It's how far, do we as far as that, yeah. you know, I, I understand where you're coming from. And, it, you know, I, honestly, I'm, I'm a... 
I'm against the war on drugs, so I, I think that we should be able to do it. I don't think that the government has the right to tell you what you can put in your body. Um, and, and you know, I, I agree that I think it, I think it's kind of screwed up that we have to, you know, it, we we are in situations in certain counties and cities where you would have to drive, you know, a hundred miles or something to to go get something that's legal, and it's been passed, you know, by law, it's it's legal now. So I get what you're saying. Um, it, let, let me ask you. Uh, I know I asked you, you know, why uh, why you were running, you know, and and what why you actually want the job, and uh, I just want to wrap everything up here and give you an opportunity to to tell people why they should vote for you, and also give them information about your website and and what they can do to get involved. Okay. Um, well, let's go we'll go in reverse order on that one. Anyone who would like more information, uh, first of all, send me an email. Um, and at Ed Owens for sheriff dot com. Um, my cell phone's out there and listed. That's my personal cell phone. Give me a call. You want to sit and talk? Um, let's chat. Um, there's going to be several opportunities out there, uh, meet and greets, opportunities where I'm going to try and get out throughout the entire county to give everybody an opportunity so they don't have to drive forever to come and meet me. Um, you can check the calendar at www.edowens4sheriff dot com. Um, please come on out, ask me your questions, interact with me. Uh, I believe sheriff should be ever present, should be ever accessible to the citizens. And that's what I'm going to be as sheriff. Um, to the citizens who are making this decision, you got four options this election. Please take the time, get to know each of the candidates, where they stand on various issues, what's important to them, and you will figure out who's most in alignment with you. And that's what, how I want you to vote. You know, this is our democracy. So I, I really want citizens, for the first time in a long time, they have a chance to really have a say in an election that's very important. And I want everybody to get out there and do that. Personally, when it comes to me, and I hope I have your vote in this election, if you're happy with the way we have been doing law enforcement in this county, um, then you have options on the table for you to consider when you, when you cast your ballot. Um, if you want a fresh perspective, um, something that's not tied to the existing structure, uh, then I'm your man, and I'm, I'd ask for your vote. Well, all right. Well, I sure do appreciate you coming on the show today, Ed. Uh, again, uh, your website, uh, I'll post it on uh, on my page and everything when I when I post this uh, this show and everything. If anybody wants to get involved with him, uh, uh, please uh, you know check out his stuff. And again, thanks so much for coming on the show, Ed. Uh, is there any other thoughts that you want to uh, get out there before uh, we take off and cut to a commercial break? No, I appreciate, Mac, the opportunity to be on your show and for your listeners to ask me questions. Um, and I'm accessible. If anyone has questions, please reach out. Uh, All righty. I want to help All answer right. questions. Well, thanks for, thanks for coming on. And uh, once again, good luck in your uh, in your race here. And uh, I hope uh, I hope everybody takes the time to, uh, to learn more about you. Uh, thanks again, Ed. Thanks, Mac. I appreciate it. All righty. So at this point, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break. I appreciate you guys sticking with us. Uh, when we come back, we'll have a uh, – I'll do a segment on the Mac attack. So uh, don't go anywhere. Support on the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. All 
right, this is the segment of the show where I give you my my take on outrageous events in the news. All right, so we got a situation going on here, and, and I, I find it a little absurd. Um, right now, the UN is debating if whether or not killer robots should be used. You know, they're trying to determine if it's against the Geneva Convention. So, you know, they basically have autonomous kill functions, and killer robots, uh, you know, could be loaded with, uh, you know, fully automatic weapons that can engage targets without human intervention. Uh, I got a question for you guys. Has anybody seen Terminator? Anybody? The Matrix? <laughs> I'm just... I'm just putting it out there. It's it, This sounds pretty science fiction to me to begin with, but I just think it's pretty freaking ridiculous that this is a, a conversation that is actually happening right now. We're talking about if machines should be programmed with artificial intelligence to kill humans. Does that sound like a good idea to any of you? I'm pretty sure that none of you out there are, I think that would be a good idea. Whether or not we're talking about how these these robots can be used to, you know, save humans on the battlefield or whatever. This is a mistake. You know, this to me is something that I would stay far, far away from. I'm not a fan of this. I just want to put it out there. If you guys have a question or would like to comment on this, give me a call. The number of the show is 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at on the move show. I'm just curious what you guys have to say about this because this thing uh, – this seems like a pretty incredible uh, situation. You know, th- there's people out there who uh, who oppose their use and, and that they think this is a threat to humanity. And I, I agree. I, you know, I think that this should – you know, honestly, I'm not a big fan of banning things. I have never really been on the jumping on the bandwagon for banning things. But this is one of those things that I just don't think that we should mess with. You know, <laughs> I, I honestly uh, – I do not think that this kind of thing – is safe. I think this, you know, weaponizing and and uh, giving AI to our drones and things like that. This is all scary science fiction crap that I, you know, I don't want to get into. I I think this is this is really something that that we need to make sure that the UN knows not you know not to get involved in and in our government not to get involved in. This stuff is scary to me. So if you guys have something to say on that, give us a call. Uh, let us know your take on it, or you can shoot us an email, and uh, I'll read it on the air. So uh, anyway, I, I want to talk about the next uh, next topic here. Uh, right now, there is a conversation happening with illegal immigration. They're, they're trying to make uh, a compromise. The Republicans are actually compromising on the illegal immigration process, and and they're saying that they need to do this because if they don't make a compromise, Obama will just go ahead and push it through, and then we'll be way worse off than we were before. So it, this is this is coming from uh, Republican Raw Labrador, I believe. Um, it, he he was talking about how uh, how basically we need to you know make it easier for for people who have been deported. Um, and and now because they were here illegally, they got deported, and now there's a three to ten year waiting period. I believe this is Labrador that said this. I may be wrong, uh, but there's a three to ten year waiting period that they have to do before they can come back into our country legally again. So with that said, he wants to get rid of that, and uh, I'm pretty against that, honestly. And actually, I, I apologize. It wasn't Labrador. It was Diaz. Ball, uh, Ballart. Uh, he's a Republican from Florida. Mario Diaz Ballart. Uh, he's the one that's that's actually trying to get rid of this um, this three to ten year time period that they have to wait before they can apply to become a legal U.S. citizen. Well, these people got deported. They were here illegally. They, they broke the law, and he he wants to make this this stipulation uh, taken away from this. That way, hey, you get deported illegally. All right, well, hey, you can just come right back in, get in line with the rest of them. No, we, the whole point of immigration, first of all, is to get the best and the brightest, you know, the people that will help our economy, business, uh, businessmen and women, you know, entrepreneurs who are going to start their own businesses, you know, people who have skills, high tech uh, skills in, uh, in electronics or, or, or doctors, things like that, the people that will come to our country and be a benefit to our country. Why are we making exceptions to the rules for criminals? 
These people are here illegally. These people broke the law to get here. We don't want them. Let's send them home. Kick them out of our country. Send them home. And on top of that, let's never let them come back because they broke the law to get here. Why do we want to have criminals in our country to begin with? So anyway, uh, I'm against this right here. But uh, in, in the whole fact that they're trying to you know, push this, this thing through, get this thing done, and they're, they're concerned about doing it before August because they say – that if it's not done by August, it won't be done, period. And then Obama will be free to do whatever he wants. He's going he's gonna to make an executive order uh, that, that's going to make this thing happen. So, you know, for me, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I'm, um, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of, of, of trying to uh, make uh, concessions for this, this, uh, this administration. If Obama wants to abuse the executive privilege, the executive uh, order power, which – you know, I think it's a violation of the Constitution. If he wants to do that, let him do it, and then we can fight him in the courts. That's just my opinion. But anyway, um, okay, so, so we have another segment here that we're entering in, and uh, this one is, uh, is, is provided by you guys. This is the segment of the show where we, uh, we take your questions, and this segment is called Ask Mac. It's time to ask you to ask you got a question? All right, I'm uh, really excited about this segment. I, this, to me, I think is becoming my favorite segment on the show, and I'll tell you, it's because I get to interact with you guys directly. You know that this is uh, you know, this is a way that I can actually uh, reach out and. and have conversations with you, and if you guys have a question that you'd like me to answer on the air, you can ask it in several different ways. You can email us at talk at onthemoveshow.com. You can post your questions on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow. You can tweet us at onthemoveshow, or, uh, and actually when you do tweet, uh, make sure that you include the hashtag AskMac. All right, uh, all right, so... I'll read all your questions uh, if you have anything, uh, or you can call us, like I said, 619-924-0986, and uh, I'll do my best of the, bil- the best of my ability to answer your questions. Uh, Angie, uh, she asked a question, and uh, she had a three-part question last week, and I wasn't able to get to the last one, so uh, I want to get to it now. Angie asks, uh, if I was to create a go bag, uh, otherwise known as a bug out bag, what would I include? What are my top ten items? So we'll round it down here. Uh, these are in no particular order here, but uh, you know, obviously you want to have a 72-hour bag. That's the whole idea of, of a go bag is a 72-hour bag. So you want to have at least 72 hours worth of food for you or your group, uh, depending on how many people are there. Uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I'm, like I said, I'm coming, coming down from a cold. I got a lot of congestion right now. So anyway um, – all right. The uh, uh, we also have uh, a, an, another important item that you should have is a water filter. So something that's going to allow you to procure a lot of water. You know, uh, they got a bunch of really awesome ones that you can find on Amazon. They're really cheap. Uh, some of them are, are more expensive, and uh, you know th- those are good too. I think the Ketadine it has a really really good one. I think it's like seventy bucks, something like that. I'd recommend that one. That one's it can do like up to two hundred gallons of water. So. That, I mean, that's a lot of water that you can filter on your way to get some somewhere else safer, you know, where you're going to have a, a better water situation. You don't want to carry three days worth of water on your back, by the way. It's not that's not really going to be doable. So another thing you're going to want to need, uh, the item number three is a hydration pack or a canteen to put your water. So, you know, if you got a camelback and uh, or just a regular two quarts canteen, one quart canteen, you need something to store the water that you filter. So. Uh, that's number three for me. Uh, number four, I would want a individual first aid kit. Those are really important. You know, if you have, um, an injury or, or a small little cut or something like that, you know, that, uh, these things can help you, um, you know, until you get to where you're going to you get to a hospital, things like that. So, uh, another important item, uh, I would get a, uh, full tang fixed blade knife and a uh, full tang means that it's, um, uh, the the metal from the blade extends all the way down into the handle, the whole length of the handle. So I think that's important. The reason why I say a fixed blade knife, full tang fixed blade knife, is because uh, you know it's less likely to break. 
you can use it uh, you know as a tool or a weapon you know that it's it's extremely helpful <coughs> excuse me i'm coughing up a storm here <laughs> all right so uh anyway the, the next item i will get is an axe uh, obviously uh, an axe is good for chopping wood you may need to do that in a survival situation you never know but it's a it's a very useful tool to have so most axes can be used in uh, many different ways as uh, as hammers or pry bars or other things like that so uh they are very helpful um another item that i would have is obviously a sleeping bag you want to have some warmth uh they make uh, really really awesome uh, jungle bags i got a couple of these uh off of uh I believe it's cheaper than dirt. They they have uh, some pretty decent ones on there, um, and it's a jungle bag that's good for like 36 degrees, and it's really lightweight and it's small. It's packable. It's you know I I, I got a couple of them, so I like them for camping and things like that. It's it's uh, not taking up a whole lot of room in my bag or on my bag, and it's not a ton of weight. So as long as you're not in uh, you know really uh, cold environments, you should be good with that. Uh, the next item number eight is a, a tent or a bivy. Uh, bivvies are really cool. They're lightweight. They're, uh, meant for one person and, uh, they're low profile to the ground. So, uh, I'd recommend one of those. Uh, I personally, I went out and I got, um, uh, two of these, uh, little scout tents. They're for like, uh, kids, uh, it, for their kids tents basically. So, uh, they're meant for two children, but it, it, they're great for one adult. If you lay diagonally and you're like, you know, six foot or under, uh, then, you should be able to fully stretch out and not have a problem. I, you know, I, I lay diagonally in the square tent and I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm stretched out and I got plenty of room on each side of me for my gear and things like that. So, uh, the next item that I would bring number nine is uh, a pot, uh, for cooking and boiling water, something like that. Uh, something that you're able to, uh, to, to use in that fashion. Um, so whatever it is, you know, for me personally, I like to bring a pot out. Um, and uh, number 10, and I would say this is a very important item, is a fire starting kit consisting of several different items such as uh, waterproof matches, lighters. Uh, you can also use your flint uh, you know, to, to start fires. Those are really cool. Um, and uh, I have used in the past dryer lint. I've collected my dryer lint up and put it into a prescription pill bottle. And then I took that out because dryer lint is extremely combustible. If you you know put a flint spark onto that stuff, that stuff will light up really quick, and it's it's really nice to have your uh, your kindling with you. You know, it, it have have stuff to build a fire with you already. Stuff that's dry, stuff that's going to burn hot, and uh, you know you don't have to sit there and mess with the fire for a real long time. Especially in the Pacific Northwest out here, it's wet everywhere. So anyway. Um, Another thing you could do is uh, is, is soak uh, cotton balls in Vaseline and uh, just throw them in a plastic bag. I've done that before. Those burn really slowly and, and very well. Uh, it, it makes it really easy to start a fire if you have some of those. So I would recommend doing that too. So uh, those are my 10 items, uh, 72 hours of food, a water filter, a hydration pack, uh, individual first aid kit, a fixed blade knife and axe, a sleeping bag, a tent, a pot and a fire starting kit. So uh, I hope that answers your question, Angie. <coughs> okay. Um, the next question we had um, was from uh, uh, Anthony Forwood, and he asks what I think about staged news stories. He wants to know if I think that they're faked stories, such as the Boston bombing, Sandy Hook, and the Washington Navy Yard shooting. So, you know, I I've seen. A lot of talk about these things being uh, false flags, uh, staged events, and I've also seen uh, interviews where the same people were at different events. And you know, there's a woman that was uh, at three different shootings or something like that, and uh, it, and she was interviewed as a witness or a victim. You know, and uh, it does it does make me question what's going on at these. You know. Uh, this, this woman is at all these locations, and I, obviously that's extremely suspicious, you know. So, could all these be staged events? Could they be false flags? Yes, you know. It, could these false flags events be orchestrated by our government to usurp our rights? They could, you know. I, I won't deny that, but have they? You know, I, I don't know, and I don't think that anyone knows for sure. You know, there's no smoking gun proof. Uh, and, and that's what makes it a good conspiracy theory, you know. But I don't like to deal in what ifs or maybes. You know, I'm a conspiracy factist, not a conspiracy theorist. 
So my concern, my biggest concern about these events that happen is that our government uses these uses these events to to basically stimulate the population. They they're emotional events. Obviously like Sandy Hook, I mean that was kids getting shot. I mean that's horrible. That was absolutely awful. And I can actually understand why people can get upset about that. I get it. But the problem I have is that our government is using these events to try to usurp power. You know, I think we need to do everything in our power to eliminate the government's ability to usurp the power. And if they are actually using these events as false flags to to basically do power grabs and things like that, then a way to prevent them from continuing that would be to eliminate the ways that they can usurp that power. So what do I mean by that? You know, anti-gunners, they have a a saying, you know, um, the left, the progressive movement, they have the saying, never let a crisis go to waste. So they use these events like Sandy Hook to try to get support for more gun control. So whether or not, you know, they're staging these events or or they're happening independently, the anti-gunners, they are. They're using them for political gain. So we have, you know, President Obama parading around the victims of Sandy Hook, the, the families of the children that were shot there. You know, and using them as as a political piece, you know, a, a leverage piece. It, this this to me is appalling. I find it absolutely offensive that that they do this. So, I think that we need to eliminate the ability of the politicians using events like these to push for new restrictions on our rights. And you know, we get so many different things like the National Defense Authorization Act. That sounds great, right? And the Patriot Act. That sounds great too, right? They like to name name these things. Stuff that sound good, you know. They always name law something that sounds like we're gaining more freedoms, you know, or, or it's like an awesome sounding name, but it's really a horrible law. Like, can you imagine the next law they have? You know, it's uh, the Americans are Awesome Act. You know, and who would vote against that? Yeah, uh, how dare you vote against the AAA Act? You're un American. You don't think Americans are awesome? Never mind the fact that the president can kidnap anyone anytime for any reason or that the NSA has now placed somebody in your home to live with you and you, know, you have to feed and clothe them. You know, but this is what it's coming to, people. You know, I mean, these are the kind of things that the government will try to do if they have a situation. I'm, I'm not, this obviously isn't happening, but we're not far from it. If you think it can't happen, just look at our history. All right? There's a reason why we created the Third Amendment where the government can't place troops in your house. All right, it, you you can't be forced to quarter a soldier, but this has happened. This happened in history. That's why they put it in there, the Third Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. If you don't know what I'm talking about, read your Constitution, people. But Great Britain, they were actually forcing people in America to quarter Britain troops, and it led to all sorts of problems. I mean, women were getting raped by these uh, British officers who were who were staying with them. And, you know, they, they were stealing their food, you know, it, you know, beating up the husbands. I mean, there's so much stuff. And these people were at, basically acting as a spy for the crown. So if you don't think it can happen, think again. You know, if if they don't have any respect for your Second Amendment right, your Fourth Amendment right, your First Amendment right, what makes you think they'll have any respect for your Third Amendment right? This is the kind of thing that it will come to if we don't say no. All right. We need to react very swiftly to politicians who violate the Constitution. You know, even if they so much as recommend violating our rights, we need to throw them out of office. Can you imagine if the American people were actually awake? <clears throat> we would see so many of our corrupt politicians impeached. You know, so many people have sworn an oath to de- protect and defend the Constitution. They don't really mean it. You know, the Congress doesn't give a crap about our rights. They just want more power. So how can we prevent these power-hungry politicians from ra- rabble-rousing? All right? how, how can we stop them from getting the, the, the public to try to basically take away the rights of the minority? Well, as you all know, I'm not a fan of democracy, and uh, I would like to clarify that we do not live in a democracy. We live in a constitutional republic, and I'm not a fan of democracy. Neither were our founders. That's why they created such things as the uh, Electoral College. You know, we, we need to bring back our country to a more constitutional republic. We need to eliminate the tools 
that these people are using against us. So, are events like uh, Sandy Hook and the Boston bombing false flags? I, I don't know, but I think I can answer. I can find an answer to this problem, you know, of it potentially being staged by eliminating the power of executive order. Now, I would love to see Congress choke that executive power out of existence. The executive order, it's been abused through history over and over and over again. And I was talking about, you know, the the New Deal, you know, with FDR. And I'd love to I would love to see the executive order go out. It was never meant to be used this way. And in fact, let me just point out the fact that there are no provisions in the Constitution from what I have been able to find. I've been looking over it for a long time trying to find it. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that the president has the right to use executive orders. That's pretty shocking. When I found out, I was, I was pretty upset. I could not believe that there was nothing in the Constitution that gave him the right. But yet we are influenced and affected in every perceivable way from executive orders. The executive order was only created to basically allow the president to be able to manage his agencies within the executive branch, not to be able to send out some broad sweeping regulation that affects you in every single way of your life. Anyway, I, I am – I'm not a fan of the executive order. Uh, I would love to see see some kind of law. And I think if if these Sandy Hook, you know, Boston bombing style things are false flag events, and and our government is the one that's behind it, and it's they're trying to use it to usurp power or things like that, rabble rouse, you know, it the lack of ability to actually make broad sweeping changes like the executive order, that would be a really great way, a check and balance to eliminate, you know, a lot of the the, the worry that we have of that. You know, I'm a big fan of, uh, of of laws that restrict the government. I'm a big fan of uh, checks and balances. You know, I, if you guys haven't checked it out, by the way, uh, you know, I know I say this all the time, but I highly recommend reading the Liberty Amendments by Mark Levin. He offers a bunch of amendments that we can uh, we can propose uh, adding to the Constitution through the state convention, uh, according to Article Five of the Constitution. I am a big fan of this book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading it. And it's on our store. Check it out on the com. Click the shop link. It's in the gear store, third one down. And it's it's in the books that I recommend reading. So that book right there, it it, it gives us a lot of good ideas about what we can do to actually bring us back to a more constitutional republic. We, we hear people all the time saying that we need to do something, we need to do something, but nobody has any plans. Nobody says what we can do or what their plans are or what they're, anything about what they're thinking about doing. You know, they, they, just, they just generally, yeah, we need to take our country back. Well, these are real ways that we can take our country back. This is, I mean, this is a, a great method that we could use to bring us back to a more constitutional republic. So I highly recommend checking it out. Anyway, at this point, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break, and we will be right back. Don't go anywhere. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Listener 
right, this is a segment of the show where I challenge you to get active, get on the move. So your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to ask yourself, what can you do to get on the move? We were just talking about how many people have general ideas of things that they would like to see, but they, they have no plans on, on how they can actually get there. So I think it's important that each one of us you know, actually does something. You know, We do everything that we can, obviously. And I know everybody doesn't have time to go out to protest and to, to do you know, everything that I'm doing or you know, other people are doing, but each one of us can do something. Do something that's going to further the cause of liberty and fight back against the left's assault on our freedom. I mean, we we are under attack, and if they had it their way, we would have no constitution. And in fact, that's a movement that they're trying to get. They're trying to repeal the constitution. I mean, this is these people are are really, you know, it, it upsets me because the fact is they swore an oath to uphold and defend the constitution, and at the same time. They're saying how it's outdated, antiquated, you know, things like that. And, and I, I really get upset when I hear people say that kind of stuff. So let me ask you and ask yourself, what can you do to get on the move? Maybe you could start a blog or, or a podcast yourself. You know, maybe you could do it better than I'm doing it. <laughs> and uh, maybe all you can do is, is write your representatives. Maybe that's all that you have the ability to do. At least that's something. I mean, it is, it's actually important to do that stuff. So, so think about it. What can you do? You know, this show is all about getting people on the move. So it, let me just point out the fact that if, if all you're doing is listening and you're not getting involved in it in some way, however big or small, you're wrong. You are wrong. I'm calling you out, guys. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. So really – you need to ask yourself, what can I do? It doesn't matter how small of an impact you can make, as long as you're doing something. Think about it like this, okay? The, it, I know it's very daunting. There's so much stuff going on. How can I get involved and how can I make an impact and change something? It's a big task to make change, to, to influence you know, policies, to, to try to hold our politicians' feet to the fire. It's a big task. But the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, and I'm challenging you today to make your first step. So that's this week's challenge. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. Anyway, if you, if you guys have uh, anything on your mind, uh, please give us a call. The number to the show is 619-924-0986. Again, that's 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com, and we'll read your questions uh, on the air, or uh, if you if you would like to have a conversation, give us a call. We'll we'll chat it up. All right, uh, we're going to move on to the next segment of the show, and we like to call it the Weekly Defender. And now it's time for the Weekly Defender. You have the right to defend your life, the right to defend your family. This is a segment of the show where we report about armed citizens in the news who have used their firearms to defend their family, their property, and their lives. So, our first weekly defender we found on WDIV News in Detroit. Uh, Paris Answorth had just arrived at her Detroit home in Michigan uh, after working two shifts when she spotted two men approaching. Answorth retrieved a 45 caliber pistol and put it in her pocket. One of the men said to Answorth, don't pull it, and fired at the grandmother, striking her three times. Answorth responded by drawing her pistol and firing at the men, striking at least one. The men were captured while seeking medical attention at the hospital. Answorth uh, also received medical attention and has been released from the hospital. Following the incident, Answorth told the local, a local media outlet, if I wouldn't have had my gun, I would be dead today. And this happened on the 6th of uh, May. I mean, this is not too long ago. Uh, the Weekly Defender, uh, from uh, another source here we found, uh, is on themonitor.com. And uh, this was on the 2nd of May. Three armed men entered Deuce's Smoke Shop in Far, Texas, and attempted to rob the store. 
An owner responded to the threat by retrieving a gun and firing at the criminal, striking and killing one and causing the others to flee. Police captured one of the suspects shortly after the shooting and have charged him with murder uh, in the death of his accomplices. Uh, Far Police Chief Ruben uh, something or other – I can't I can't read that name. It's like Villas, Villescas, something like that uh, – told local media that he does not ex- expect the owner to be charged. And uh, you know, it, I find it pretty crazy that uh, that people would suspect that the owner should be charged. You know, this man is defending his uh, his, his store. Anyway, um, we at On the Move we support your rights. So if if you have a story about how you defended your life, you know, uh, from using uh, force like this, we would absolutely like to hear about it from you. Uh, or if you'd like to comment on one of these stories. Uh, give us a call. The number to the show is 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. We believe that you have the right to defend your life, a right to defend your family, and you have a right to defend your freedom. We at On The Move, we support your rights, so give us a call, and we'd like to hear from you. So at this point, we're going to cut to uh, the last commercial break of the day, and uh, we'll be right back to wrap up everything. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. All right, we're back. So I am uh, going to wrap up the show a little bit early today. Uh, I sure do appreciate everybody tuning in. And uh, if if you guys would like to get in contact with us uh, for the next show, give us a uh, a call, 619-924-0986. Or you can send your information to talk at onthemoveshow.com, and we'll be happy to, uh, to listen to what you have to say. And uh, we can read your questions on the next episode. So... Uh, make sure you get involved. If you have a question for the the Ask Max segment, we would absolutely love to hear it, and we'll include it on the show. I want to thank each and every one of you, our listeners, uh, for tuning in week after week. And I would also like to thank our uh, special guest, uh, Clark County Sheriff Candidate Ed Owens, for joining us today. Don't forget to check out his website. He's got a website, Ed Owens for that's the number four sheriff dot com. So check that out. Uh, see what you guys think about him, and uh, and you know make an educated decision on uh, on who to elect in this uh, upcoming election. So uh, to get more information on us, you can check out our show at onthemoveshow.com. You can listen to us here every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow. You can also find us on facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow. Don't forget to like us on there. And uh, you can subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash on the move show, and follow us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash on the move show. And as always, know your rights, assert your rights, and get on the move.